you want to talk a little more about Johns Hopkins? Do you want to talk a little more about Johns Hopkins? Do I? Well, would you? <coughs> I'm pretty tired. Let's talk about something else that I don't that I don't feel the weight of, you know. How is she? How is she? My mom? Or was that was, was he re, was he kidding when he said it was her calling? No, I wasn't. No, I was smooth serious. It was my mom. I know, but I mean, he said on his way out. Your buddy said she's calling again. No, she, he was kidding. He was kidding. He's not from San Bernardino? No, he's, uh, he's a local boy here. He spent a year writing on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Get out of town. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, Do you know that the present king of Jordan was an extra on S Star Trek Deep Space Nine? <laughs> <laughs> when he was Prince Abdullah, he asked to be an extra. That's what we're dealing with in the political system. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Correct. Please. Okay, I, I am working on, on an idea for a series, and uh, I like the idea of setting it around the United Nations, kind of like a West Wing at the UN, and I was thinking, you know, because I'm looking for a way into this, and the, the best thing I've thought of so far is what if Jesse Jackson, or someone a lot like Jesse Jackson, wound up as Secretary General of the UN. And, and I, I like the, the, I think there's some political possibilities there, but that's about where I'm at so far. But I've, I've got some other ideas about it, but. Can you imagine what it's gonna be like casting the ambassador from Namibia? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Set it in a whorehouse. <laughs> that services the ambas the workers from all, you know, uh, in the series that I'm doing, uh, there was a book called The Happy Hooker. Xavier Hollander. Xavier Hollander, whose whorehouse was on 52nd Street, right around the corner from the UN. And uh, the big challenge for people who work uh, you know, ambassadors and, and others uh, is that uh, uh, they're lonely. They're lonely and they're supposedly tremendous successes. If that don't take you to a whorehouse, you know. Uh, and the job of the prostitutes is to make them feel at home, no matter how much ivory they got in their noses. Um, that is the fundamental theme of the United Nations, isn't it? But you never go wrong associating any fundamental theme with whores. Uh, I, I was uh, interested in, uh, uh, for an hour and a half uh, at one point, in doing a series called The Whores of London, uh, in which Helen Mirren was going to play the, a British madam, and Sarah Jessica Parker was going to play an American madam who had been turned out as a whore by Helen Mirren, originally trained as a whore. And they now are friendly. Uh, rivals, and they work for every different spy service, debriefing, you know, getting state secrets out of the people, be because London to me has become sort of, uh, if you got the money, doesn't matter what you believe anymore, we'll treat you like royalty. And uh, the, way to, uh, uh, the way to deal with a political topic is never to say the word politics. So that essentially what you're doing is telling a story of Western culture, which has so given over its soul to materialism 
that it will serve as a ditch for the semen of every other culture and embrace the illusion that it's spying on them. Now, you could do that, you know, with the United Nations, too. Uh, isn't this interesting how you can find s the premise of series kind of everywhere if you try and stay? Who raised you? What's your name? My name is Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi. My name's Phil. So the premise is that uh, a guy who was in a boy band. 10, 15 years ago. Now it's his own band. He's touring Europe, and the audiences aren't showing up. It's tanking, and he comes back. He's a drunk, drug addict, and he comes back to Manhattan, where he grew up in Queens. And uh, they catch him with, you know, narcotics coming through customs. And they realize who he is, and, and the FBI shows up, and they've, al they've already got a, a, uh, a rapper that some guys upstate have busted for drunk driving and they're going to put him in the tank for 30 days as part of but they but they know he's killed people and he's completely notorious but that's the only thing they got him on right now the only thing they got the rapper on is a drunk driving charge and they got to throw up they he does 30 days he's got to do 30 days in the betty ford clinic or something like that so they want to use the boy band guy you know the backstory as an informant to get in queens and he was a you know he was a cop for eight years before the band took off and and so he's got a little experience in that. And that must have been a pretty old boy band if he was a cop for eight years. Well, like 28, right? You started your cop at 19 or something, right? And he takes off at 28, and now you're 38, and you're in the ditch. Well, what about if he was in a boy band, became a cop, got caught wrong with narcotics after three months, and then, you know, that? I mean, that would let him have been famous for a while as a boy band. But anyway, so now they want to put him in the same jail cell and get him they to... They want to put him in the same it. recovery thing, in the same, and, you know, completely justify being in Betty Ford in one of these high-end recovery units. So, they, so, they so, so the rapper is not a collar? He's not in jail? He's not in jail. They haven't been able to bust It's him. an alternative. The 30 days that you're saying yeah. is he had to agree to go to rehab. Right. But they're looking... To so get him put for somebody this. in there with him to try to get next to him and, and go undercover, essentially. And they've already lost one to this guy. They've already lost a, a young female FBI agent to him. She's disappeared. They have no idea what happened to him. They lost an FBI agent to the rapper? You know, if you lose an FBI agent to the rapper, what, the, what tends to happen is the FBI takes you to the Holiday Inn Express and attaches some electrodes to your testicles and finds out. Uh, but, but, uh, okay, so that aside. Then. <laughs> right, but, but uh, here, w one, one way about, uh, uh, to the extent that we, and uh, you've been around a little bit, right? You're in your late 20s yourself. And, and uh, uh, to the extent that uh, we've lived, you know, with our noses pressed up against, uh, the uh, invisible shield, you know, that surrounds the walled city, uh, we tend to internalize a lot of stuff, one of which is the gospel of meeting cute. Are you familiar with that term? Uh, that you, you build up a premise where two seemingly very different people meet cute in a cute way and then find out that they've got a lot in common. And in this case, uh, my suspicion is that what happens is that the former member of the boy band develops a friendship with this guy and uh, can't give him up because he realizes that their experience has been very similar. They were appropriated by the capitalist system to its own purpose and exploited and then spat out. Um, now, uh, if we're on to ourselves, if we're on to our habits of mind, uh, and 
if we've been rejected for a little while, we internalize, again, in terms of going to the familiar, we internalize and try and protect ourselves. I'm dealing with this with the fucking negotiating committee right now, where all the negotiating committee for the Writers Guild can think is, well, if we do that, what are they going to say? Uh, you have so complicated your premise as a way of trying to anticipate objections from the buyer and say, well, but it's broad-based. It's, it's Queens. It appeals to whites. It appeals to the a demographic, not exclude, uh, 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 35 to 49. In fact, it appeals 18 to 49 because it has rap, but it also has rock and roll from an earlier era. And all of these sort of invisible demons are flying around as you imagine the pitch session. Right? right? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, fuck them. Now, how do you say, how do you train yourself not to be in fear that way. What's at the heart of the premise? Two guys make friends. Uh, what's uh, uh, the fundamental venue be after the long, complicated exposition of how they get there? What's the fundamental venue? Rehab. Forget the rest of it. Two guys in rehab and same backstory, no assignments. Forget the FBI agent, forget the it's it's just the guy who got caught wrong there and uh, at a certain point whoever he was mewling for, you know, suppose he, he came up uh uh, he came in with some, uh, you know, balloons up his dirt chute for, for, you know, whoever sent him over, right? And uh, uh, he doesn't know where to, he, he's got something hanging over his head. But don't hang a lantern on it. I mean, if you're going to reveal that stuff, don't reveal it till way, way back, uh, till deep in, you know. Just let him make friends. And then, so, so, that, so that what engages the viewer's imagination and your own is the dynamic of how two guys seem to hit it off. And in the third episode, or whatever it is, or maybe at the end of the first episode, now you have the white guy, you know, in a meeting saying, this is what he shared. You know, now he's reporting on something that a guy shared, you know, in, in like a 12-step meeting or some fucking thing. Or you play that, that what the guy has shared, what, the, what Tupac was sharing there, and now at the end, they take him to the Holiday Inn Express, and instead of putting electrodes on the white guy, they say, okay, you know what the deal was. And what the guy says is, he didn't say a fucking thing. Which refutes all of your own fearful fantasizing about what the true premise is. And now they go out on the road together, or whatever, and, and the black guy says, this is my backup. And now you have this white guy from a boy band trying to do fucking, you know, moves for, for Tupac, and everybody laughs at him, except Tupac. And if Tupac isn't laughing, pretty soon the brothers, you know, in the audience, hey, fucking man, it's, you know, we got a different thing. We got a different thing. <laughs> but it's still a thing. <laughs> fucking ignorant nigger. Um, but simultaneously, the cops are still trying to get this guy to deliver. See, but just don't let yourself be distracted 
by doing the exposition. Just started in the rehab. And the, this idea of the cousin, I mean, I think I got there with this idea of the cousin. Who's the cousin? You're saying the cousin of the, the basic premise. And then I start going, oh yeah, and then here's another cousin. And then yeah. it builds, you know, and it's almost like I gotta do the opposite here, yes? Yeah. Yes. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's uh, sometimes the, the recognition of the genealogical connection is by moving backwards instead of going forwards. You know, just eliminate things. What time is it? It's quarter to four. Okay, now the next question is, when did we start? 2.15. That's an hour and a half. That's... You want to do one more? 15 more, yeah, 15 more minutes. <laughs> ruthless. You're ruthless. Yes, Jim, man. My name is Jim. Jim. I moved my name out is Gary. To, I moved out to California with my mom. Um, That's so funny I about that. I was about that. seven. <laughs> and we were part of a religious cult. And we yeah. lived in an ashram down on West Adams, which was not like a historical district in, in, that, uh, in that time period. But it did have some history. Oh, yeah. We, lived we just the hadn't house. realized it. The ashram that we moved into yeah. was, uh, used to be owned originally by Busby Berkeley. And in the foyer, there was, um, it was marble and there was his initials. Yeah. And that was where me and like seven other kids lived in this ashram. That was like our favorite place to go running in our socks. You know, that was like the big. Your favorite place to go running was where in Busby the Berkeley. Uh, by, yeah, by the right across Busby Berkeley's initials. Gotcha. You like run in from the living room and hit the hit the marble in your socks and like get a good slide going. Um, and we we're all part of this religious cult called the Movement of Spiritual Inner Awareness. And the guru of the cult lived up in Mandeville Canyon. And he would like roll around in his um, limousine. He had this like brown limousine. And he'd like to go to like Bat Burger. A brown limousine. A brown limousine. <laughs> <laughs> that swine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my mom sent me to a, a private school. And I never, I, for the six years that I lived in the cult and the five years that I went to that school, I never told anybody where I lived. Because I never, I had so much shame. Why? Um, because I was weird. I was different, you know. I mean, I was lived the, like uh, man in a the shitty part of town. getting over on any of his acolytes? Later, I found out about it. At the time, I didn't know about it, but he well, lived... so at the time, he didn't know about it, but at the time, he was he, getting over. He was. He had a staff that lived with him up in the house in Mandeville Canyon. And, um, he was bringing the hammer down from the brown limousine. Uh, it seems like he Possible. might. Possible. It seems like he might have. I mean, and, and what's more disturbing about One day, that. I wonder if that had anything to do with Busby Berkeley's <laughs> pillar. <laughs> was that my uncle was like the man who was like the man behind the guru. And he ran like the business aspects. Who's, whose uncle was this? My uncle. Your mother's brother? My mother's brother. Was I'm there any uh, transgression of boundaries involved with your mom and your uncle, do you think? No. Um, and so it was, it, I found that, you know, I'd go to school and went to a private school and a few, like, celebrities' kids would go there and that kind of stuff. And, and I, I would, I could never tell anybody there, you know, where I lived or where I went after school. Now, uh, you two are in your late 20s, right? No, I'm in my 30s. I know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, what, but uh, so this would have been when? Late 19, 70s. Say it again? Late 70s into the early 80s. Uh, at a time when it was not considered outré to be in attendance at an ashram, right? I mean, some people might have thought it was hip. Well, I, you know, I mean, at the school that I went to, which... What was the school? Curtis School. Was that a private school? Yes. And it, did your mom come out here with a little dough? Um, not really. Who paid the tuition? Partially scholarship, partially my mom. And uh, did that suggest the fact that she would send you to such a school, a little bit of self-division in her about the way she was living? Not necessarily. I mean, what she always, well, maybe, and I, I'm not aware of it. I well, mean, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to track down the, the reason for the shame. 
sometimes, you know, when, you know, when I told you the story about these hands throwing out the money, and I thought if I could only figure out whose hands they were, and I finally realized that it wasn't that person's hands at all. Uh, well, I always thought it was financial. I mean, I, I, you know, like saying, all these kids I, I get picked that up that in Rolls Royces and whatnot, else. you know, and my mom, you know, had a Toyota Corolla. Okay, try, try and listen to what I'm saying. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. Uh, but, you know, we have all different kinds of stakes in remembering things a certain way. Uh, there is something other than what you think is going on in your recollection. And this isn't therapy, this is storytelling. So what I would suggest is that uh, every time this kid walks through the doors of the Curtis School, he enters into a Busby Berkeley musical. <laughs> Inexplicably to himself. Because there, and you know how Busby Berkeley used to love to do the shots from above where you would see a pattern that was composed of individuals, <coughs> but which transcended individuality. And let the audience identify, have, have all of the classes in the Curtis School be seen from above in the pattern of a mandala, and let the kids stand outside watching, and then just see where the action goes. And that may be a way to unblock. The fact that you mentioned Busby Berkeley in an incidental detail suggests to me, and then you describe sliding across the floor past those initials, that there is something in the environment created by Busby Berkeley that would secretly liberate your premise. And so that's what I'm going to suggest that, that you do as an exercise. Every time he walks in the door of the Curtis School, uh, it becomes a Busby Berkeley musical. And then he doesn't tell anybody about it, you know, when he goes home and have the head of the ashram show up in his brown limousine and have the head of the ashram fixate on him and say, what's happening with you in school? Okay? You done? Very good to see you all. And uh, uh, if we're all alive, Maybe we'll, well now, wait, wait a second. When is Christmas? Tuesday. When? Next Tuesday. It's next Tuesday. Yeah. Well, we're not going to meet, what are you, crazy? <laughs> All right, we'll meet on Christmas. No, we will not meet on Christmas. <laughs> Maybe we'll take next week off. You want to do that and then see, see what's going on afterwards? But anybody that wants to talk, you know, uh, my phone number, pencils at the ready which is breaking the fundamental tenet of our strike, which is pencils down. 310-264-4285. <laughs> Ask for Big Gary or Big Phil. <laughs> and that's how I'll know you're at the class. See, you know, when I, I give a different name every time I introduce myself, that's to show that the idea of identity is really a function not of a stable name, but of association. So that no matter who, who I say I am, I'm still the same psychopath. <laughs> and that thing has survived as well, right? Okay. Have a good weekend. Merry Christmas.